Hello, I'm the Angry Spork, taking issue with Stan Lee's DC. From Dark Knight to Dark Wrestler, from Amazon Warrior Princess to Incan Warrior Goddess, we've been treated to very different but affectionate recreations of some of DC's most famous icons. Now let's see if Stan Lee's take on The Last Son of Krypton makes us want to turn the page or turn our heads. <laughs> Joined by John Buscema and Chris Chukri, the cover has a painted aesthetic to it, with the main character in the center, in a classic Superman pose, with a crackling light behind him separating various other images, which, spoilers, actually happen in the story. We begin on a planet with an impronounceable name, according to narration, so let's go with not Krypton. A woman named Lyella is looking out her window, musing on the wonder of a newly discovered green element that can bend space and time, appropriately called the space-time bender. Bender, bender, bender! Bender, bender, bender! That actually sounds like what happens when Emmett Brown gets really, really depressed and decides to use his DeLorean to go bar-hopping throughout the centuries. Her husband, Selden, seems more interested in his workout, as he gets enough action as a law-bringer. This, of course, is translated into Earth Basic, which isn't actually a language, so I'm not sure why he didn't just go with English. Unless this was for international sales, too. Anyway, he's working out because his fellow cops are genetically enhanced, and he needs to get swole in order to be the best. Which I'm sure is code for wanting to avoid dealing with that inferiority complex. He leaves for work, with Lyella alone with her nagging feeling of impending doom. Lyella was right about the impending doom, but it wouldn't start until 2003. By which time this story will be long over. We see what his planet's architecture is like as he exposits scientific marvels like his flying harness and the space-time bender. He meets up with his squad, who are dealing with a hostage situation aboard an interplanetary cruise bus. If it's an interplanetary vessel, why is it called a bus? Are all the passengers uncomfortably seated too close and the driver is a crusty middle-aged dude that won't change the radio station? Is there gum under the seats and a bunch of cranky kids complaining to their overworked mom? Well, they said it was a cruise bus, so maybe they also have shuffleboard. The other officers, dressed alike but oddly enough different than Selden, say they can handle the crooks because they are genetically enhanced, which offends Sal, but it also feels like an unnecessary statement given the earlier conversation. Maybe it would have felt less clunky if Selden mentioned it to Lyella that he wanted to be the strongest, leaving the reason more vague only to be specified here. Anyway, after a couple of them get zapped with a stun bomb, Selden grabs a grenade and throws it over the cruiser, drawing terrorist fire to the other side. And another little typo of Till, just like in Wonder Woman. Unlike his squadman, Sal is slim enough to make his way through the gear hatch right to where the terrorists are gathered. He notes that all the hostages are safe, but considering they said there were 300 innocents and we see one one-hundredth of that here, he must be taking quite a leap in logic. In any event, he takes out all four, even taking time to explain to one how he punched him just so to get him to shoot his buddy. Which kind of feels like rubbing salt on the wound. Of course, the way this guy acts, maybe he's not above literally doing that to the guy that got shot. After one panel of Saldan and his captain watching hologram news about the terrorist plot they just foiled, because that was the best time to say he's clocking out, we go right to a maximum security prison yard, where inmate Gundor Gorok throws a prisoner at a guard, steals his flight harness, and takes off, with revenge on his mind. He bursts into Saldan's home, because that's the cop that put him away, and Lyella tells him he'll be sent back for good when he returns. Seconds later, she's tied and gagged, maybe to prevent any further cheesy dialogue, when sirens close in. Right after Gorok leaves, Saldan has returned to find his wife dead, and a note that's pretty garish given the context. After looking like a stage actor hamming up a tragic scene, he's borderline threatening his own teammates to find out where the killer is. The officers are arming up and heading to confront Gorok, who's gone to the space-time bender. Arming up? I'll tear him apart with my bare hands! But only after aiming weapons at each other that could end the fight in seconds, only for our manliness to be questioned. So we throw the guns away and start punching! Do you want to avenge your wife, or did you just finish binging all three Expendables movies? I can want to revenge fight for two reasons! 
Gorok shoots a couple of people as he exposits on the impressive amount of knowledge he has on the experimental device he's commandeering. Designed for a crew of two, it's the only one of its kind, so no one can follow them, even knows how to set coordinates for an air-breathing planet in another galaxy. As opposed to one of those mud-breathing planets, I suppose. Seriously, how did he know so much about this thing? Did he stay current with technological breakthroughs, or is he deceptively intelligent? When Saladin arrives, Gundor just... Let's him right in, then launches the craft to knock him back. Gundor is fine because he put on his safety belt. Using basic vehicle safety. Does this animal's cruelty and depravity know no bounds? Suddenly being a polite, vengeful psychopath, he waits a while and wakes Selden up, asking if he'd like his death quick or slow. The alien cop kicks the weapon away and decides to do what prisoners couldn't, and do away with the slimy, stinking, murdering maggot himself. In mid pummeling the widower notices they're coming in hot on a planet, and he tries to instinctively navigate the controls he is unfamiliar with. And yet they were a cinch for Gorok, who takes the opportunity to knock him out because there's no time to finish him off. He grabs a spare shoulder harness to make an escape, because maybe he doesn't realize his enemy has one on. I mean, it is a new model, so... maybe. He leaves to try and conquer whatever life forms are on the planet as the spaceship hits the water, essentially becoming a submarine with unresponsive controls. It's been suddenly rebooted by James Tinney IV, because being stuck at the bottom of the sea and unable to function truly speaks to what a spacefaring vessel is. The cop figures that intense water pressure is keeping the outward hatch closed, and yet he still decides to demonstrate for himself how easy it would be if he had crashed on land. Which is just a silly pretense for him trying to open the door anyway, and he's torpedoed out of the water with very little effort, a first indication of his abilities on the strange new world. It's just weird that he seems to relegate himself to doom, then escape because he was entertaining the idea of a different scenario. It would have worked better if he just decided to try it anyway, if only out of frustration. Moving on, Sal surfaces and notices two things of interest. The green element having leaked into the water, so yay, space pollution! And the city in the distance. He speeds past some sharks and makes it to the shore in mere seconds, deciding to try and sleep off what he thinks is an hallucination. When some goons try to shake him down for money, he makes short work of them, even though he's not using too much force. When his wrist communicator falls off, slowly according to him, he determines that this planet's gravity is one one-hundredth that of not Krypton, so he doesn't feel as much resistance. Compared to the people of this world, I'm some sort of Superman! I should dress like a furry mammal with wings and terrify criminals, while using a bow and arrow, and my battle cry shall be FLAME ON! He runs along a road at enhanced speed before leaping behind an abandoned gas station, resting among its many discarded tires. Because of the thin atmosphere, his vision is telescopic, which is a much more tenuous attempt to integrate that power than the others, I gotta say. But he ponders how, with his wife dead, he hasn't got much of a home to return to, but then reconsiders how he should endeavor to get back in honor of her memory. Somehow. There's still the matter of apprehending Gundor, so he tries to take flight, but his harness isn't working, though he still decides to keep it to remember what he's lost. He could have said that he wanted to keep it so alien technology didn't get left behind on a less developed planet, or that he might try to repair it, but no, let's go with sentimentality, why not? He walks around the city a bit, where people gawk at him, some mocking his clothes, but a couple of girls that look like they slipped right through a time portal from the 1980s seem to take a liking to him. Hey, glop onto that far out hunk. Wow, he can frazzle my fantasies any time. I thought Selden was the alien. I can't tell what those two were saying. Wasn't Stan translating this? Ah, yeah, dang it. And why is Stan finished translating? Because Sal picked up on the entirety of American English by looking at a newspaper, which apparently confirmed only 26 letters in our alphabet. Back home, our alphabet has more than a thousand! And that was only so we could impress those ritzy nearby planets with 400 punctuation marks. On an undisclosed island, Gorok knocks around some warriors of an undisclosed tribe, and they start revering him as a god for it. 
But even dancing ladies isn't enough for him, since he figures he's powerful enough to rule the world, make everyone his slaves, and orders to be carried to the nearest seaport. Could have been worse, he could have told him to take him to the furthest seaport. Though I wonder why he doesn't use the flying harness he snagged. Did it run out of power when he reached the tribe? Did he lose it? Back to Selden, he's wandering around needing money and convinces a circus owner to let him replace an injured trapeze artist, and starts his show off by centering the tent pole with plenty of amazed spectators, though they look more like pod people posing as humans. Yeesh. He leaps up and balances an acrobat on each hand while doing a headstand on the bar. It's a genuinely cool-looking trick, even if it was drawn that way. As he's getting paid, Sal is asked his name, something you'd think would have happened before he went on stage, so the ringmaster, you know, knew who to announce. Figuring Earthlings too primitive to embrace a space alien, he pulls a name from an ice cream truck and a nearby street sign, which fortunately results in Clark Kent. Though his cover might have been blown if a different truck had driven by or they'd been in a different location. Oh, my name. Uh, it's Domino's and Roadwork. Uh, who might you be? Upon closer inspection, the other name on the truck is Peter, and the other street is Parker. Now, that's just delightfully clever right there. Don't know if that was Stan's idea or the artist's. Either way, it's pretty awesome. The boss is ready to center an entire show around Clark, but he instead takes off, since he just needed the money for more important things. Good thing he happened upon a circus, which will always be a reliable and lucrative job prospect. The circus is dying, people. And yet his payment was enough for rent on an apartment, a computer, and a television, so that was probably a couple thousand at least. And this is around Los Angeles, so you gotta consider, did the audience tip him too? Like, with diamonds? Anyway, E's learned humanity has taken steps towards space travel, but figures progress has been stunted by wars, crime, and other such conflicts. So Sal figures he can make it back home if he ends all aggression on the planet and gets them to focus their time and finances outside their own orbit. A simple task, I'm sure. An inquisitive reporter stops by, but Sal immediately brushes him off, preferring to figure out how to find Gorog and end all conflict on the planet. He takes inspiration from comic books left behind by a previous tent. He's got good taste. They're all about superheroes. Yeah, but they were left behind, either by oversight or they were so terrible they didn't want them anymore. Yeah, they were abandoned for a reason. I guess we'll just forget the fact that superheroes are a concept probably alien to this guy, so why would he have an opinion on them? From these fictional tomes, he gleans that heroes keep their identities secret to avoid being hounded by the public and being made into lab rats, which is pretty cynical considering some heroes do it to protect others, but in any event, he decides to pass his abilities off as attributes of his suit that he'll try and pass off as his own patented invention. Though I'm sure the patent office would have some words. He got all that information on superheroes just from one issue. I guess Sal was reading a Stan Lee comic. Inside a Stan Lee comic. Holy cats! We've entered Stanception! Ah! Gorok coincidentally finds himself in LA, robs an ATM, which he recognizes has money because his own planet had similar machines. Okay. Then is stopped by a kindly old couple that invite him to meet Reverend Dark, who's expecting the stranger. Inside, when the cloaked figure suggests Gundor serve him, he takes offense and threatens him with furniture. With the merest thought, I turn your bench to ashes! Joke's on you, it was your bench, stupid. With the newcomer impressed, he leads him through a mystical portal, where more answers await. Meanwhile, Lois Lane knocks on Clark Kent's door. She's a talent agent looking to make him wealthy and famous, even has the same thought he did earlier of calling him Superman. Though dismissive of her at first, Selden figures that going public could draw his nemesis out. That's when we get the first indication of yet another classic power. His super hearing, which lets him detect people rushing to the door just before they burst through it. They're government agents that want his suit, and Selden just hands it over, even making some cheesy jokes in the process. Watch your lip, mister. We're government. So help me, we'll stagnate on important issues, rely on false information when it's convenient for us, and drag along our gullible constituents. Don't think we won't! For some reason, the agent decides to, right then and there, try the harness on, 
thinking it what was enabled Selden to do his amazing feats at the circus, only to fail hilariously. A lawyer hired by Lois bursts in, threatening a lawsuit if the shoulder harness isn't immediately returned. So what, did that guy arrived with Lois just hang out in the hall waiting for the eventuality that not only would Clark agree to be represented, but that he'd immediately need legal shielding? That is like overpowered Batman levels of precognition right there. The TV's been on this whole time, making it convenient for everyone to hear about terrorists kidnapping the Chinese president as he landed in L.A. Aside from their $10 billion ransom, it could spark a war pushing space programs back even further. So Selden, reharnessed, heads out the window and flies off, feeling a bit like being on the police force again. And yeah, the harness is suddenly working again, even though we never saw it get repaired. Amazing! Those jets of his don't make the slightest sound! It's Whisper Quiet! Sal has popped over to the Pentagon, where he tells a meeting of generals he has a plan that only he can enact. One of them knows of Sal's circus act and says he should be allowed to speak because of his uncanny abilities. You said the same thing about that last foreign diplomat you appointed, and she was terrible at the job. You never gave the bearded lady a fair chance, and you know it. Later, the kidnappers are in a helicopter, picking up their ransom, specially packed as instructed. However, it's not greenback stored inside. A laser beam is fired, opening up the ground to consume the camouflaged Saladin, then closing it up again before the chopper lands. Later, U.S. Rangers are deployed, but find the aircraft was operated remotely, and digging reveals a tunnel with tracks that seem to be going down into the earth. And then, as if by prearranged signal, it caves in. I, I don't know what to make of this. I mean, the, the, the pickup, the ransom, didn't have wheels on it. So I don't see why there are tracks. There's nothing for the wheels to latch on to. And also, it's going downward, straight down into the ground. And how do they make the tracks and put the tracks in the under? It's all so confusing! Miles away, Sal makes his presence known, but this was anticipated by the terrorist's leader, Gorok, who kidnapped Lois because of course he did. Goons chain up his foe, but then Gundor mentions Sal's late wife. This gives him adequate motivation to emulate his namesake further by busting his chains apart. Because nothing can stop him now. It's a neat homage, but a little sudden since he just got tied up, so not much room for any kind of tension to build. While saying something about power and brute force, not exact but similar to Dark earlier, Selden throws some goons, one of whom hits Gorok, allowing Lois to be freed, even though she seems overly concerned with the publicity she could get out of all this. Think of the endorsements! Nike! Kellogg's! Nintendo! Get real, Lois! This isn't a game! And if it were, we should definitely lean more towards Adidas, General Mills, and Xbox! He flies her out of the tunnels via manhole, meaning they were in the sewer? And no one could have smelled that? He has to go back for the abducted president, despite the apparent odds, and his survival will net him an ironclad contract with Lois Lane, so... I guess those comics he read never covered overzealous and ambitious agents. When he returns to the tunnels, Gorok sticks his goons on him again, but he just knocks them down and ties them up with the metal rails of the tracks. Now, Gorok, it's... Payoff time! Don't you mean payback time? Or are you suddenly accepting bribes? Gundor fires a rocket, allegedly able to bore halfway through a mountain, but misses his target and causes a landslide to get trapped in. Certainly the major metropolitan area above is just fine. That rubble seems like a satisfactory restraint, so Sal goes looking for the president but unable to find him underground and the 12-hour deadline before possible war nears its end, he meets up with Lois on the surface. Can't say I much like how she's going on about getting the highest possible bid from the American military forces should they want him at their side. There's being career-minded and then there's being a sociopath. Sal recalls something Gorok said about the Prez's whereabouts. Only time will tell. Ugh, because she thinks there's time to get him on the Tonight Show. Seriously, lady. She points him in the direction of a clock tower to get the time. It's too far away for her, but not Superman's vision, as he sees the President of China tied to the minute hand, with bombs taped to his chest. Apparently... 
leaping? They were miles away, but suddenly he's maybe a block or two from it? And can he not fly anymore? Anyway, he rips the bomb off and throws it in the air so it doesn't harm anyone. No lettered sound effect could do justice to this explosion, so we didn't bother. Scrupulous Stan! Kaboom. Bakum. Or just plain boom. Any of these would have worked. When did Stan Lee become such a sound effect snob? Police and citizens gather as he lands safely with the president. I realize your government was blameless. Well, yeah, my government is on a planet light years away, and... Ah, uh, nuts. Comics really don't prepare you for this stuff. Later at a diner, Superman seems concerned if Gorok survived and how he amassed that terrorist group. Lois tries distracting him with all the offers they're getting from movie studios, Disney and Warner Brothers being the funniest for various reasons. You know something, Lois? You're a treat for the eyes, but we're just not on the same wavelength. Now, if you were an intrepid reporter, so keen on getting your story that you'd constantly endanger yourself in situations where I'd need to save you, that would be another matter. As long as you were still attractive. They leave the eatery, and Lois, through inner monologue, revels at all the money she'll make and all the women she'll need to keep away from her client, who she's going to handle exclusively and dump all her other clients because that sounds incredibly smart. However, things aren't adding up for Selden, not last son of not Krypton. Gorog couldn't have had the time or knowledge necessary to plan such a kidnapping, so he had to have had help. He wonders where to start looking, as they pass the Church of Eternal Empowerment. Plot relevant sense is stingling. On the streets begin with a man in shadow, demanding Superman on a silver platter, refusing to accept failure. Is this a dastardly new supervillain? A Machiavellian businessman? Close. It's the editor-in-chief of a comic publisher going on about how they've matched the competition time and again, and now he wants the rights to print Superman comics. What's hilarious is not just the addition of a writer that looks very much like Stan, but the others are likely modeled off others in the industry in days past. What's weird is how the IEC, Joe, mentions this real-life superhero is an alien, so mentioned by the Daily Planet. Did Sal fail to keep his identity hidden, or did some reporter make a strangely accurate leap? He adjourns the meeting and bellows for his lawyer slash brother-in-law. Brother and lawyer? He wants to make sure they can print Soup's comics without the guy's approval. Not an American citizen, not protected by copyright laws and all that. He hopes this will make fly-by-night comics move beyond the likes of Marvel and DC, and how proud his founder uncle would be of his fat nothing of a nephew. Huh. He was actually called that. It seems like a pretty harsh criticism. Even deserving of sympathy. But this is a satirical cartoon, and if he's as bad at the job as certain real-life EICs, I think it's okay to laugh at it. Some months later, Joe is celebrating selling a billion Superman comics, when Lois Lane barges in and <laughs> her business card is just awesome. From the emphasis on her client to the slogan, just, it, it, it's great. Joe uses the aliens have no rights defense, and Lois counters by shoving his cigar in his face with her bare hands. I mean, that'd have to burn her, right? But she doesn't react at all. Likely an oversight, as this is a humorous story. Ticked off even more, Joe orders her out, but Lois, noticing a train approaching, pretends to call Soups and have him come over for a meeting. Given they've been in this office so long, it really speaks to Joe's stupidity that he doesn't realize it's a train making the building shake. He really is an EIC. Fearing it's the real superhero deal, he promises to stop publishing comics about him and pay up for using his likeness in the first place. Taking a taxi, Lois rings up DC, who just so happened to need a feature for Action Comics. So that was Stanley's Superman, and no disrespect, it wasn't quite as enjoyable as the previous two installments. And part of that is on the main character. Selden has decent enough motivation, but his personality leaves something to be desired. He's just an acerbic guy with powers, and there's not a whole lot more to say. As nice as the main cover is, the alternate has an angry grit to it that seems to fit the character better, if nothing else. Some things could have definitely been better explored, like his past concerning Gorok, the S-shaped scar on his face, which I'm wondering if they're connected, as well as his feelings of being the best now that he's arguably the strongest around. He is to humans what his squadmates were to him. 
His idea to basically enact world peace in order to motivate Earth to speed up their space program would promise plenty of stories for a character like this, much like the green element polluting the waters, but again, his attitude is kind of a turnoff. There's a lot to like about his costume design. It's unique while still evoking Superman's classic color scheme, and while the addition of his crest is nice, you could remove them without really detracting anything. It's not like the little S's got explained anyhow. Some of his enhanced abilities based on Earth's lower gravity were more of a strain to buy than others. Speed, sure. Strength, sure. But hearing and vision? That's kind of stretching it based on parameters they set, like how quickly he learned English. I guess given all the breaks he got, it was only fair for Gorok to just so happen to kidnap Lois, who only met Sal a few hours before. Wouldn't want to be one-sided with our conveniences, would we? Speaking of, while making her a talent agent isn't the worst thing they could have done, they absolutely went overboard with her drive to get him on talk shows and cereal boxes. There were times it seemed like she was detached from reality. At least the lane we've known for decades was chasing stories to get to the truth. While it certainly has its moments, the main story does feel a little shakier than the first two comics we looked at. But the on-the-street segment was a whole lot of fun. Next week, we look at how Stan reimagines a different kind of space cop. I'm the Angry Spork, and man, I got issues.